And Lord, may the thoughts of our hearts and the words of my lips be pleasing to you, O Lord. And I speak to you this morning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If you relish conflict, you might not be saved. If, when you sense an interpersonal conflict arising and you feel the red mist of revenge rise in your eyes, if, when you are in the vicinity uh, and an interpersonal conflict kicks off and find yourself rooted to the spot as a gleeful eavesdropper, if, when you hear tell of an interpersonal conflict, you cannot help yourself from getting the goods. Well, you may not be the owner of a heart regenerated by the Holy Spirit. How do those statements strike you? Do you feel conflicted in your heart? Do they cause your mind to flicker to certain past situations where one or two or perhaps all three of those descriptions were true of you? <clears throat> well, here's an important distinction. There is a world of difference between someone who is characterized by relishing conflict, someone who enjoys it and seeks it out, and someone who sometimes finds themselves in the midst of conflict and sometimes falls prey to one or more of the responses that I described earlier. So take heart, beloved, for if, like St. Paul in Romans 7, you wrestle with your remaining sin, and you are characterized by fighting against it and not simply giving in to it, if you are ready, willing, and look forward to confessing your sin and, and receiving absolution in just a few minutes, you're on the right path and you are right with God. Thanks be to God. So, to our text. Now, it's axiomatic to say that Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, without the stain of sin during his earthly ministry, did not relish conflict. But for someone who did not enjoy conflict, he sure caused a lot of it. The healing of the paralytic, which we examined together last Sunday, Saturday. It's still going to take me some time to get used to this. Good to know. How many years? <laughs> Two years. I feel safe here. The healing of the paralytic occasioned conflict with the Pharisees because Christ claimed to have the authority to forgive sin. The brief account of Christ and his disciples eating with tax collectors and sinners caused more conflict with the Pharisees, whose tradition stipulated a strict separation, actually a class-based segregation between the people of the land, the blue collars, the normies, that is, anyone who did not observe a pharisaical lifestyle. From the Mishnah, the collection of Jewish oral traditions with the force of law, I quote, he that undertakes to be trustworthy, that is a Pharisee or a disciple of a Pharisee, may not be the guest of one of the people of the land, nor may he receive him as a guest. He should not recline a table in the company of ignorant persons. Yet, that is exactly what Christ did. In eating with sinners, Christ was declaring that people don't need to clean themselves before he accepts them. The cleaning comes later, and it is primarily a spiritual cleaning. Everything else follows from the free offer of gracious acceptance by our Lord himself. 
Perhaps you know people who take a pharisaical approach from the opposite direction, who may say, oh, I can't come to the Lord until I am a little bit more clean, until I've got my life together a little bit more. Then he'll accept me. That's nothing but reverse Phariseeism. Of course, the attitude of the Pharisees is nothing new. If you've been in the church any amount of times, uh, you come across them, and perhaps you have been one. I know I have. The Pharisees wanted sinners to clean themselves up first, and to essentially become Pharisees, or at least disciples of Pharisees before, or so they believed, God would accept them and their sacrifices. Remember, we are still in the time of temple sacrifices, in the time of Christ's earthly ministry, and for another 30 or so years after. Indeed, the Mishnah, again, goes so far as to teach that Pharisees cannot even sacrifice, offer a sacrifice beside a person of the land, beside a normal person who isn't quite up to snuff. Imagine that. A Pharisee is not allowed to go anywhere near a normal Israelite person who is attempting to obey the law by sacrificing for their sins at the temple who is obeying the written law of Moses with the assistance of the priests. Why? Because their oral tradition says so. No wonder Christ castigates the Pharisees for their man-made laws, especially those that contradict the spirit of the law of Moses, which we'll see in just a moment. You could say the poor people of the land are damned if they don't, damned if they do. And that is also exactly what the disciples of Christ face in our text. So those two scenes are the backdrop or the precursor uh, for what comes next, which is our own, the text we heard today, a crescendo of controversy with Christ at the center. We see in our text three questions from the Pharisees, three answers from Christ, and one final pronouncement from Christ that stuns everybody into silence. So the first question in chapter 2, verse 16 is, why don't your disciples fast like everyone else does? That's the implication. The text says, why don't your disciples fast like the disciples of John and the Pharisees? But the question, whoever it comes from, we, we don't know exactly who is asking, probably the scribes, they ask most of the nasty questions. But I'm glad they asked the questions because it means we have the answers from Christ. Here the Pharisees fault the disciples for something they don't do. It's never happened to any of us, has it? None of our parents ever faulted us for something we didn't do. We as parents have never faulted our children for something they didn't do. Okay, my tongue is firmly in my cheek. Notice that Jesus isn't explicitly included in the critique. But they do obviously hold him to be complicit. Now, the Pharisees don't dispute that Jesus had authority, but they despise his authority. And so, as you will see if you have a Bible like mine, if you, will, if you, you can easily see if you have a Bible like mine with red print, that Jesus asked answers with a series of three parabolic images. I suspect Mark is setting up his readers for the longer parables in chapter 4, which we'll take up in a couple of weeks. At any rate, these three images describe the disciples' appropriate responses to the coming of Christ. 
Jesus calls them friends of the bridegroom. Who is the bridegroom? Christ Jesus himself. He is ready to be married to his bride, the faithful people of Israel, a.k.a. the church. And that's reason enough to rejoice. In fact, it would be an unfaithful response for them not to rejoice. It would be an unfaithful response for them to fast, like the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees. They will fast soon enough when he leaves them to ascend to the cross. But for now, they feast, because he is here. More than that, they feast with sinners, because Christ came not to call or eat with the righteous, but to call or eat with sinners. Those who are well, those who are righteous, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. I, Christ, came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Who are the sinners? All of us. Those who know our need for a Savior. Now, a lot of preachers at this point spend a lot of time on these, these illustrations, the, the bridegroom and the, the garment, and especially the wineskin. And it's wonderful to unpack those, but these illustrations are further elaborations of this wedding image that we won't spend as much time as we perhaps normally would. Suffice it to say that a tear in new wedding clothes can be repaired with an old shrunken patch, not only because it would just look horrible and people at the wedding would ask you, what are you wearing? But because eventually though, there will be a bigger tear there than before. <laughs> and a wineskin that has shrunk and dried out because the wine in it has been drunk cannot be filled with new wine or it will explode. And you'll not only have a broken wineskin, but far worse, spilled wine, not fit to drink, travesty. And what is a party without good wine, as we see at the wedding in Cana? The Gospel of John, uh, in the Gospel of John chapter 2, if you recall, that is the very first and important uh, miracle that Christ does in the Gospel of John. So, the presence of the Son of God on earth, calling disciples to follow him, is the pre-wedding party, anticipating the great banquet of the consummation of all things, the final salvation of heaven and earth. I don't know how many of you watched the Grammys I stopped a long time ago, but those Grammy after parties have nothing on what we're going to experience at that final banquet. And the disciples themselves, not just the 12 or the 70 or 120, however many there actually were, they are the wedding clothes and the wineskins. They are the people who recognize the king, whose kingdom is breaking into the world. And they can do, indeed must do, nothing except celebrate. In the next section, the Pharisees damn the disciples for what they are doing. Right. And again, as children, our parents never did that. And as parents, we have never done that, right? We know what it's like. So first, the disciples are damned if, that they didn't, and now they're damned that they do. And here, they're doing something that looks totally innocuous. Wandering through grain fields. Now, I've wandered through a grain field. Hands up if you have too. Okay. Were you being watched as you wandered? Did the bylaw officer jump out and give you a ticket? No. Now, plucking the heads of grain and eating them is not the problem. The law of Moses required landowners to leave grain for the poor and allowed 
for the poor to pluck that grain. Hence, what Boaz does for his, his paramour Ruth in that book of the Bible, leaving grain among the, around the edges of the field so she can pick it up and be nourished. But the Pharisees had a rule for that, no surprise. No plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath became a rule because that amount of physical exertion amounts to work, or so they decreed. It still happens. My parents were on a trip to Israel a few years back, and their Jewish hosts asked them to turn the lights on and off during the Sabbath. It's the same principle. And Jesus, in his genius, responds with Old Testament precedent, citing what David did with his men to simply stay alive and maintain their strength on their path towards installing him as the anointed king of Israel. Sound familiar? That is, eating the bread in the temple that is lawful only for the priests to eat. Indeed, Abiathar the priest hands David bread and says, eat this, it'll do you good. Because bread, even the bread in the temple, is still for eating. Not just for looking at, it's food, not a still life art. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, says our Lord. You've got it wrong, you've got it backwards, Pharisees. Keeping the Sabbath ought to serve and bless people who follow God's ways, not the, the other way around. So the first two questions in our passage have to do with what is allowed, according to the Pharisees, or not allowed, according to the Pharisees, on the Sabbath. But that is merely the presenting problem. One of the many things that stuck with me through my seminary experience, I, I had a wonderful seminary experience, grad school, to become a pastor. To accumulate a pastor's toolbox. A lot of pastors, uh, they joke around and call seminary cemetery. So they didn't <laughs> really learn anything. I did. I left seminary with a pastoral toolbox, and I'm endlessly grateful for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Believe it or not. Well, one of the things that my pastoral professor taught me was that in any conflict, in any issue, there is usually what is the presenting issue, what looks like the issue, and the pressing issue, what is really the issue behind the presenting issue. They're not often the same, sometimes, but not often. So in our text, Sabbath, how to keep it, what is allowed, what is not allowed, according to the Pharisees, that is the presenting problem. The issue on the surface that looks like and feels like the main problem. The thing that's, that's creating all the anxiety, or so we think. And in walking with his disciples and responding to the Pharisees, Christ has been warming to his theme crescendoing to his climax. And only now does the pressing problem, the real problem, come to the fore. With, with echoes of the healing of the man with the demon in Mark 1 in the synagogue of Capernaum. Same place, in fact, that synagogue. If you're the cynical type, if, you might wonder if it's all a setup. You might wonder if the man with the withered hand has been planted by the Pharisees to provoke Jesus to break the law. Setting him up to break the Sabbath law as if he does what? Heal somebody. Now the Pharisees are relying on people's ignorance here. 
At least, at best, that's what they're doing. At worst, they're keeping people in the dark in order to control them. They're doing whatever serves their agenda. So Christ asks, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? And what's the response? The answer is no. Jesus knows that full well, and in fact, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the answer, or non-answer, from the Pharisees. Because healing doesn't even figure into those 39 rules of what you are not allowed to do on the Sabbath. Here, finally, is the pressing issue. Christ is surfacing the purpose of the Sabbath, and that is the God-given flourishing of life. Whether feasting and celebration at appropriate times, or eating for the sake of sustenance of life, or restoring a body part to full functioning. All things he has done in our Gospel text today. So, it's supremely ironic for the Pharisees to portray healing as breaking the Sabbath. And it's beyond ironic for them to begin plotting his death when he has only come to give life. But as we know, he came to give life by giving his own life <coughs> on the cross. So now we need to ask, so what? So what? What do we do with this? Well, engaging in conflict is not a problem. It's why and how and when we do engage with conflict. Let's take those in reverse order very quickly. When we do. When we do. Proverbs gives two seemingly contradictory instructions in the very same verse. I, I remember when my kids who attended Christian school had to memorize this verse. They memorized the words. They had no idea what it meant. Here it is. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So which is it? Do you answer a fool? According to their folly, or do you not answer a fool according to their folly? Well, it's all about context. How did Christ know how to answer? I don't think we can we can believe that his an his answers were prescripted, but were products of holy wisdom in the moment for the moment. Wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Secondly, how we do. How we do engage with conflict. Here Christ is our pattern. <clears throat> and as unreachable as his perfection is to us mere humans, being continuously and progressively sanctified into Christ's likeness means acting like him in harmony with him incrementally more and more often. Again, how? By the Holy Spirit. And finally, why? Why would we want to engage in conflict like Christ? Because he is our supreme example. And while we do not and cannot enjoy the unbroken connection with the Father and the Spirit that Christ enjoyed, we can glorify him and show ourselves to be his disciples whenever we live and move according to the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, joy peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And Christ in the Gospel of Mark shows us that the, God, the fruit doesn't preclude holy wildness at times. 
times when it's warranted. For Christ came not only to give life, but to give life more abundantly. May it be to us according to your word, O Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.